Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today is the first episode of our multi-part series. We'll be speaking with Polish organizations and leaders that are helping Ukrainian refugees and the and displaced. Our series begins uh, uh, with OGDM, with the OGDM Foundation and the essential work they are doing to help Ukrainian uh, mothers and children. And in particular, we're going to be talking with uh, Jakob Lan, co-founder of From Border to Flat or From Border to Apartment. Um, and that foundation is providing amazing service. Thank you for coming uh, to us. Where are you located right now, Jakob? Uh, so at the moment, I'm uh, speaking from Poland, Warsaw, so the capital of Poland. And thank you very much for inviting me onto the show. You know, I just heard your mayor, the mayor of Warsaw, and he has a amazing facility to take complicated issues and encapsulate them in civil society, very human terms. Could you talk a little bit about what you are experiencing in Warsaw? Because it is really amazing. You know, countries complain when there is a slight uptick comparatively to population in immigration and in uh, refugee status. But you have basically, in Poland, you're absorbing 10% of your population, um, but overnight. So tell me a little bit about what the picture is like from Warsaw. So maybe I would just start by saying that it's, uh, and I'll put the government aside from our conversation, and it's going to be about the Poland as a nation. Uh, so something that I cannot stress enough that every single poll uh, has done so much uh, from the beginning of the invasion. Um, and what's interesting is that the uh, support is um, continuing. And obviously, uh, you know, uh, the government had a lot of uh, challenges at the beginning. And then you can sort of narrow it down to uh, to cities like Warsaw. Uh, uh, but uh, all of the uh, achievements, uh, I would probably not uh, give to, to mayors or kind of, you know, to the president, but to every uh, single volunteer uh, that has done anything. So uh, I would probably also stress that it's not about, um, you know, how much uh, the city or, or OGDM as a nonprofit, uh, how much we've done so far, uh, but it's just uh, amazing to see that, you know, you just uh, uh, talk to anyone of your friends or, or extended friends, and then uh, uh, someone uh, has done something in the past uh, three months. It is. It really is impressive, and and you are so right. There is a place for government action in in civil society. Of course, there is a place for uh, very various organizations. But it is the individual that has responded that has created the organization. It is the the um, the the mother with their own children who are worried about their own families. It is the father who is. Uh, who has their own children and their own families. It is the elderly and the young who are responding in this really amazing and spontaneous way. Where do you think the source of that response is? Is it, is it a self-identification with the problems that the Ukrainians face and an understanding that, that we too could be in this situation? Absolutely. And I think you're, you're totally right about that. And there is the, uh, uh, you know, historic aspect to that, because, uh, as you know, in, uh, in 1939, uh, we were kind of left alone as a country. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, many generations of the sea passed. And if, if you kind of uh, live in, in a history told that, you know, uh, we had to uh, kind of make it on our own, uh, then it's only natural that you step in in any capacity you have if you see almost an identical situation with with the the horrific invasion, right? So, um, so this is why I think it was a no brainer for uh, for anyone. So, uh, you know, from from essentially day one, uh, the, there is a number of different convoys going immediately to the border. Uh, filled up with food, water, clothing, blankets, anything that, that it's needed at the border uh, or any reception point. And then, uh, you know, people are driving back uh, with, with uh, Ukrainian refugees. Um, I did five trips on my own and then uh, I was taking uh, more people than allowed in a car uh, by the law. 
Uh, but you know, e even then, you know, people were kind of, uh, let's say, closing eyes and knowing that we were doing it uh, as a country, as a nation, for the right cause. Um, and you'd be surprised that you know I, I would receive calls or make calls uh, uh, late at night saying that I have seven refugees with me. Can I can I have a place for for a day, for a night, or for a week? And you'd say, yeah, of course. They can stay with my, in, in my place, even though, you know, sometimes it would be a, a full family uh, with uh, young kids going to school, but people would share essentially every square meter and, and uh, food they have. Well, and, and the, the thing that I think you're describing is that people are getting into their own personal cars, paying for gasoline, which is quite expensive, spontaneously moving to the border now over time that spontaneity has evolved into a little bit more organization. So let's talk a, talk a little bit about where you started. So we, we talked a little bit about that sort of spontaneous approach. Mm -hmm. And again, you bring people into your home that you do not know, right? You then open up your cupboard and see what blankets you have, what pillows you might have, how you can bed somebody down for the night, or you might have a friend and then you sort of figure it out. But over time, you you created an organization. So talk a little bit about that transformation from that spontaneity and, mm -hmm. and how that worked with you driving to the border yourself and, and where you are now and, and what those intermediate steps were to create the organization that you are still evolving. Sure. So maybe I'll just start with a uh, short story. So essentially, it all started with a post that, you know, I, I'm going definitely on my own to the border. Who's joining me? Then we had two convoys from two cities, 19 cars all together. Um, and then all of a sudden, we started a movement. And I, we were definitely not the only people doing that. Uh, uh, but to, to put things fast forward, um, uh, we ended up with a group of 1.7 thousand volunteers mixing different uh, services. So whether it was kind of, you know, uh, allowing to people to stay at their flats or uh, driving to the border or helping to coordinate um, all of the actions. So hence the name. So actually in Polish, it's od granicy do mieszkania. So it's from the border to the flat or to the apartment. Um, but as you rightly mentioned, um, you know, the wave of people crossing uh, uh, our border uh, has significantly decreased over time. Uh, what's interesting is that more and more people are coming back because oh, everyone is hoping. So you're having traffic in, in both directions now, whereas before it was flooding in one direction. Absolutely. And, you know, everyone is hoping that uh, the war will uh, uh, essentially end soon. Um, and uh, I can tell you that most of the people from our organization would have uh, some kind of a uh, business slash financial uh, background. And our approach to that, because um, um, me and my co-founders, we, we dropped uh, what we were doing before. So essentially, this is a full-time uh, gig for us. And um, something uh, that uh, we, we applied immediately uh, is, uh, I would say, a management consulting uh, style of, first of all, understanding what is a challenge, uh, uh, then, you know, uh, putting some hypothesis and testing with various deliverables uh, with different projects that I'm going to, to quickly tell you about in a second. Um, and we're seeing essentially where we can deliver uh, the biggest impact. So let's pause for, for a second there, because you're talking about the uh, chaos of the early days, right? And the spontaneity of the early days. Now, what you're doing is you're going to your own bank account, you're taking your own money out, you're taking your own personal car, you're using your own resources. And of course, those resources are finite, right? So right. while you're responding, you're also running out of the wherewithal to respond yourself, including time. So Absolutely. you change your whole life in order to to pursue the solution of this next problem. And it's a problem that that continues, right? Because as long as people are continuing, as Absolutely. long as the war is continuing, this, this will uh, continue. So you go from that. So, so And then you talk about a management consulting approach. So how do you deconstruct the problem? How did you deconstruct the problem? And how do you start to, pro to solve this issue of, of time, personnel sure. resources, money, um, and then uh, the flow of individuals to some sort of service. 
Sure. So uh, uh, starting with, uh, you know, that even it's not the uh, uh, inflow of uh, refugees to Poland, because uh, we are here to stay as a nonprofit. In fact, we are obviously a, a you know a fully registered nonprofit in Poland. We're about to be a 501c3 in the US because we have a number of uh, pledges um, and, uh, um, that we would like to then kind of, you know, put together uh, behind our projects to, to uh, fuel the impact. Funding and advocacy in the United States for your organization, mm-hmm. people that you serve. Um, and I'll give you a, one good example how we uh, uh, put that approach behind the problem. So you can imagine that we were, uh, and it's more of a logistical problem, but uh, we uh, at the kind of, you know, the, the peak of the number of people crossing the border and kind of as a reminder, it was, uh, you know, around minus five, 10 degrees and people would be queuing in, in like two, 300 meter queues just to cross the border. Right. Uh, so the, the need was um, uh, beyond immediate. So that's one thing. Uh, then on the top of that, uh, you would have a finite number of flats that are available for the people. Um, and uh, what we decided to do is uh, to create two coordination centers uh, uh, at locations of the company that is hosting us. Um, and it's a gaming company called Kingwin. Uh, and we're forever grateful that you know we could use uh, their premises essentially to, and we're continuing to use to, to operate. And we would create a a systematic process to increase, first of all, the number of people that are taking from the border and also making sure that they're allocated uh, to the best city or town uh, as they wanted. Because you can think about kind of as a diagram that some people uh, treated Poland as a kind of, you know, pit stop uh, because they would have family and relatives, say, in Germany. Uh, you would also have people uh, who also treated Poland as a pit stop because they knew that they would like to establish their new lives elsewhere. So we would then coordinate work with different organizations from different cities, and uh, sorry, different countries, uh, moving people, for instance, to Portugal. There are some cases with um, the UK or the US. And, uh, you know, from, from the numbers point of view, if we're talking about kind of, you know, uh, thousands, thousands of people, uh, this is where it gets uh, very sort of tedious and detailed to create a process that is repeatable and first and foremost uh, scalable. Um, and we wouldn't be able to do it with kind of, you know, your, I would say, uh, standard approach, just kind of, you know, that there is a problem because we uh, uh, then uh, try a number of different um, optimization processes. So almost like a process optimization. Well, absolutely. You're, you're, and, and, and this is really important to understand, right? You're, you're sequentially solving problems. You were talking initially about the fact that people were queuing hundreds and hundreds of meters uh, long, hundreds of yards long um, in the dire cold with, with very little protection. So you start solving that problem. Then when you move people into flats, uh, into, into the border areas, those flats end up becoming saturated very quickly. So now you're moving uh, westward through Poland and also to other destinations to relieve some of the resource constraints that you have in Poland. And the the other thing that I think is really interesting here is that you're informed by Polish history. You're informed by the history, not only uh, in 1939, when the Russians uh, took over Poland, but um, but also the partitioning of Poland through history from the 1700s, the dissolution of the Polish-Lithuanian um, uh, uh, territories, and then the, the this tradition of having Poland sort of carved up amongst uh, great powers, and then reestablishing its identity uh, with a thousand years uh, of, of history, and you're actually responding in a way that the populace that is informed by this history is very sensitive to not having this kind of fate uh, occur again. And and Mm -hmm. solving, meanwhile, you're solving logistical problems of moving people in and integrating and so on. Uh, Talk a little bit about the various programs that (laughs) you've involved as you've solved each of those problems. And let's talk a little bit about uh, the the discrete services that you're providing and the organization that you require in order to provide those services. 
Right. And just a quick comment that it was Nazi Germany uh, invading us uh, in 1939. 1939, I'm sorry. And then the after. Uh, the, the, absolutely. But then, obviously, we know the story. So, so just a quick uh, thing. Uh, so in terms of the project, and I would just focus on the uh, uh, um, these ones with the sort of biggest impact that we have. Okay. Um, so uh, we are uh, creating a steady supply of medical supplies and medications that are later distributed to hospitals in Ukraine. And obviously, we always focus on the humanitarian aspect of that. Uh, so we, you can imagine that there is just unlimited uh, supply needed for um, for the military. Uh, um, and we're again, we're hoping that this is going to end very soon. Uh, and uh, this is uh, another program where uh, we're actually involved with a number of different uh, American organizations. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I can certainly say that we're working with um, amazing, amazing person from the Shriners organization, Laura Kozlowski. And, um, you know, uh, we, we started collaborating on, on moving things from the U.S. that are obviously legally um, kind of, you know, and not prescription needed that we can move them to Poland and then uh, on to the different routes. Um, then um, uh, there is uh, the kind of brain behind that operation. Uh, it's Austin Potter, uh, who is uh, the US lead of OGDM and the person that is going to drive our 501c3. Um, and uh, this is something where we can put uh, unlimited resources behind. Uh, only because uh, you, you can imagine that uh, if, if you can kind of you know, sit comfortably on a stock of, of any supplies and distribute them rightly, they're, they're in constant need. It's, and it could be that you know, there is a hospital that, for instance, is uh, overstocked for some time, but then all of a sudden, uh, you know, there is a hospital in the nearby area that, that needs um, um, similar um, equipment. So you have a logistics operation um, uh, optimization problem to do. You have a funding problem. You have a logistics op operation to deal with. You have to move goods and products and services to the appropriate location, and and you have a number of different um, different um, initiatives. So l l let's just let's just go through them. The first that you mentioned was the relocation. Right, the relocation initiative to try and get people to where they can find a home, where they can take uh, better care of themselves, where they can rely more on their friends. You also talked about the the hospital. Um, uh, I guess, uh, um, and, and I'm uh, I'm not going to pronounce this correctly. Uh, uh, Krizwin, Kshivaruk. Yes. So there is a hospital in Kshivaruk. Exactly. Right. Uh, so this is. <laughs> south, southeast of Ukraine. Uh, and there is a number of different hospitals that we're essentially building a master list of and trying to have it updated as soon as possible. So whenever someone is traveling, because at the moment we were doing it more of a partisan way that, you know, someone is essentially buying a luggage and then buying extra three or four boxes. We are now thinking about a more, I would say, cargo approach. So we, we are even uh, trying to uh, uh, see whether we can get sponsors for it empty legs in private jets. So sort of from New York to Warsaw, uh, because then obviously the value of the things that we'd be moving um, via such a route is way more expensive than uh, paying for the flight itself. But we're trying to again work uh, with a kind of most agile approach. And and um, in the, in the uh, hospital in Chivaruk, all they're doing is they're providing medical services to those who need it. So if somebody comes in, and it's a civilian, you treat those people. If somebody gets across the border and they happen to have been wounded from the fighting, those people are treated. So it's just about, it's just what, what the Red Cross has always done. It's what medical organizations have always done. If somebody is, mm -hmm. uh, is in need, uh, there's a service and the, and the supplies need to flow because you cannot either um, give uh, sanitary services or uh, a, a surgical services or, or whatever without those supplies. And then you also have, the, the, there was this initiative, which I thought was interesting, Rock for Ukraine. Now, Rock, Rock for Ukraine 
the you know music and cultural uh, side it would not seem to be a, a a service, but is it a service given the fact that we have people who who need to come together and 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 share? So talk a little bit about about those sure. services as well. So so with Rock for Ukraine, I mean it sits on our website and it's an initi- initiative that we have been supporting, but it's actually uh, not something that we ran or we invented. Right, it's uh, right. Brian Allen. Um, uh, a fantastic person. And I think it's someone you, you'd probably would like to invite onto your show because he's doing so much and, uh, you know, the therapy via music and everything that he has done so far from the, it's something that would probably, you know, I could talk um, hours and hours about the, um, the things that he delivered. Uh, however, if you think about our strategy uh, the, and, and starting sort of with, with the bottom and, and our older projects, it's almost like the hierarchy of needs. OK, so it's the Maslow's pyramid. And uh, since we were uh, first addressing the physiological needs, um, we are now putting every project against the pyramid and seeing you know, which level it is addressing and our sort of, uh, you know, uh, OKR or kind of the, the main KPI is to move 100,000 people all the way from the bottom to the top of the pyramid. And something that kind of is my dream is that uh, we'll have enough funding that uh, one of the kids that, that we saved in the process uh, will be, uh, for instance, sent to Harvard for uh, the MBA, you know, like full sponsorship. Uh, but obviously, uh, all the steps sort of, you know, the, first of all, getting them food and shelter. Base is the physical immediate need, right? For food, exactly. shelter, exactly. kinds of things. And then you get into the sustaining need, which is to create some measure of self-sufficiency. And eventually mm-hmm. you feed the mind and the soul uh, when you have a, a certain uh, sense of security. And what you're saying is that you're not neglecting, even in the early days, you're not neglecting thinking along all these these vectors because you can't get any sense of normality unless you're thinking uh, in those terms. Let's talk a little bit about your background because you've you unpack this in a very systematic way. Um, what is your background? Talk a little bit about how you um, and your team have been trained to uh, that enables you to respond in this way. And and sure. also it's very clear through your references to business you have a business background. Now you're a business person working and dedicating yourself to a civil society cause. You will not get rich doing this. I no, get- I won't. So talk a little bit about first your background, and then let's talk a little bit about your own personal views and your motivations. Sure. When the invasion started, uh, so I had been running a software house so essentially, uh, you know, a tech business that either builds products for entrepreneurs or uh, uh, there is this concept of body leasing. So, uh, you know, Polish software engineers are world class. So we would then have clients uh, globally where we would essentially uh, lease uh, developers to join their existing product. Teams. Right, so you would design software, you would be coding, you would be doing... Um, uh, so, so myself, I'm not a software engineer. So uh, uh, the closest to my background, I would say probably that, you know, I, I feel as a entrepreneur uh, and I just absolutely love coming up with ideas and then executing and kind of realizing them in, in where But your teams would be coding. You would be basically yes. taking people who had certain skills and you would find exactly. clients, create the connection, mm-hmm. and you developed a revenue model out of that. Absolutely. And previously, I had a brief romance with the world of finance, so with investment banking and private equity. So this is where kind of, you know, this concept of management consulting uh came closer and and uh, this is why it was way easier uh, to apply it in in the uh, current situation and at OGDM and you know our little small vision which obviously will take decades to deliver but we would like to be considered as a, you know the class of McKinsey for humanitarian crises and obviously for that we need to have uh, you know top class people uh, uh, not only believing in the cause, but also uh, with the, uh, I would say, sufficient business aptitude to, to deliver all the projects and the ambition projects that we have uh, in the pipeline. And, uh, uh, you know, learning on, on the situation uh, that is currently happening in Ukraine and being a bordering country, 
it, it, it's, some, it's the experience that we can later on apply uh, anywhere else in the world. Uh, and we can put all the experience, expertise, and bro models and processes uh, and apply them faster to what we have done uh, uh, with the current situation. So, Jakob, um, explain this to me. We have in this in this world economy, particularly in the uh, more developed nations, have adopted this idea of selfishness of mm -hmm. let's go where the money is, let's take our expertise and invest it where we we can personally and our families can can earn the most. Right. And what you're saying is you want to actually instead take your expertise that you have laboriously developed and invest it in something where you can earn the least. Why would you do that? Uh, good question. Uh, but it's a very simple answer. Uh, I have never been so satisfied with the things that I'm doing or I have been doing for the past three months ever in my life. So, you know, uh, you can always increase uh, revenue, you can grow EBITDA, you can increase margins, you can grow teams, you can execute new businesses, buy other businesses. But then, uh, uh, you know, uh, the smile of the face, if, if you pick someone from, from a queue uh, with a small small child, uh, everything kind of you know lost in their country. You kind of uh, I don't know drive to to McDonald's, buy them food, buy them uh, little magazines, and see smile on um, children and faces. It's nowhere near uh, uh, satisfying in terms of oh wow our business has grown uh, at you know kind of eleven times in the past three years. It's great, and I by by the way I I'm still uh, sort of involved in certain business activity that I'm advising or, you know, uh, doing deals, but it's a, it's a kind of, you know, I would say five to 10% of the, as you can imagine, I'm not working eight hours a day. Right. So change, just to make it clear. Change a person's life forever, right. By a, by a small act of kindness and stacking those small acts of kindness, kindness upon kindness upon kindness. In a sense, what you're saying is your hierarchy of needs has, has undergone a shift. Where Absolutely. you decided that that what you need more than than beyond a certain level of comfort for yourself, what you need more is comfort for other people and and a a civil society that works for a broader set than just your own family, mm -hmm. your own self. Is that I can tell you about because it? It, yes, and it's a, a, but having said that, it's it's a very interesting question because uh, we started uh, from uh, the idea of kind of you know being selfish and egoistic. But if you think through the concept of helping others, you're certainly then doing it because you're in a way teasing your ego because you get out of helping others some kind of a level of, again, accomplishment, right? So uh, I totally understand that uh, it, it's a complete, let's say paradigm shift from, from you know, growing a business. But, uh, you know, there is satisfaction that you can grow something at a very fast pace, deliver a lot of impact. And um, I would be lying to you that I'm not getting a, kind of, you know, any uh, personal satisfaction, but on a different level than helping people. And I think a lot of people involved in nonprofits would probably agree with me. Yeah, we don't have to be saints. We just have to convince ourselves that saintly acts is something that is so satisfying that we yes. wouldn't want to forgo the experience, right? I mean, that's that's really that's really the issue is is shifting our minds. We can selfishly decide that we feel good helping others yes. and Absolutely. do more of that, right? It wouldn't that Absolutely. be a nice world? Exactly. And then, uh, you know, there is this just one uh, word that is driving, I guess, everyone at our organization. And I guess uh, karma, you know, like uh, you just uh, apply the, uh, you know, multiplier factor to it. And, you know, uh, if, if I just think about um, the number of meetings and people um, I met throughout the last uh, three months, uh, and just the, the, the level of kindness and motivation to help others, it's kind of, you know, it, we, we believe in something called the law of attraction. So we're just constantly attracting people, uh, kind of doing uh, not, only, not only good things for Ukraine, but obviously there, you know, there, there are many other aspects that needs to be tackled. So we work uh, 
uh, with different organizations uh, tackling different things. So it's not only uh, if I can kind of go back to projects that that we organize. If is it a good time? Can I do that? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So uh, uh, the second most important project. Um, uh, apart from the, uh, let's call it kind of, you know, the hospitals in Ukraine, uh, it's essentially um, helping uh, the Ukrainian school uh, called Materinka in Warsaw. Uh, so imagine that uh, pre-war, it was a school with 200 students. Uh, I, I visited the, the school today, actually, uh, with one of the uh, US donors just to show around uh, uh, the place and you know where the money can potentially uh, be spent uh, and what are the most basic needs, including you know even chairs, because they're old wooden chairs, not very comfy for seven-year-olds to, to sit. Uh, and you know, uh, all of a sudden you have a headmaster uh, with five new locations and with 1,000 students and with another 1,000 on their waiting list Mm -hmm. And when I asked, do you have the precise numbers? He said, sorry, but I'm too busy kind of trying to make the uh, end year happen that I'm just going to worry over the summer school. And this is something that uh, kind of pushed us to think about potentially the OGDM chain of schools. Uh, and we were starting with a proof of concept uh, over the summer. Uh, and again, a very interesting aspect because of the uh, situation of COVID, uh, you know, the vast majority of companies moved to um, to the remote setup. And you and I'm sure you're experiencing the same uh, in the US. You'd have a lot of empty offices. Right. And actually, uh, uh, someone who sits uh, on on our supervisory board, uh, Michael Kaczmarek, has kindly offered that look, uh, maybe. Potentially, uh, we can think about uh, uh, having one of the uh, uh, spaces, uh, if there is going to be money for rent, etc., uh, convert into a school. So that's something that, uh, uh, and then again, you know, there is this word that probably describes best uh, serendipity. Like there are two 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 um, teachers from Kharkiv. Uh, they used to run a music school, and we bumped into each other. In, in one of the meetings uh, and uh, they, they are, they're looking for a place. So it just felt, wow, it's a great occasion to join forces. And if that proof of concept works, uh, again, we're not sure whether it's going to be that office, but uh, I can tell you that we already had a number of different calls with different companies that are willing to give us their offices. We can then be, again, kind of, uh, we'll learn over the summer how to do it. And then just so we start the regular classes, uh, probably starting with, classes one to three uh, uh, post-summer. Um, and then uh, they can uh, follow uh, not the Polish education system, but you know, being pushed out of their own country. I don't see the necessity to, to be uh, kind of tied up with the uh, Polish curriculum, but they would be uh, uh, kind of you know, taught whatever they would have been in Ukraine. And that way, we're again minimizing the impact of the war, right? So, and you're creating jobs for teachers who have been displaced. Absolutely, you're, you're, absolutely. you're creating family cohesion. You're honoring a a uh, another culture by the considerate way in which you are uh, thinking about this problem. Jakob, what I'd like to do is um, I'd like to, uh, and we can do this offline. We can talk about sure. doing a series of reports on the initiatives that you and, and your partners are undertaking. Um, that is great. And let's, let's make sure that, that these initiatives are documented because not only <laughs> is it going to be important to connect what you're doing to other supporters in the world, but also the experience that you have could be very informative for how, how we as a world can respond to this flood of refugees, sure. which, whether it's in Africa, or whether it's in the Middle East in, in the, along the Syrian border mm -hmm. and so on, um, these kinds of issues are going to be with us for a very, very long time. I'd like I'd like to give you the last word if you could summarize what we can all do to help and support you and to help and support others like you. What kind of of counsel would you give us? How should we think of this and how should we behave? I know money is always an issue. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, but could you give us any kind of guidance in terms of how we can sure. use our time productively for you? 
Sure. So uh, uh, I would start that uh, the best source of information in terms of how people can help OGDM, uh, uh, remembering that you know our uh, kind of true K- true North KPI is helping over one hundred thousand uh, Ukrainian kids and mothers. Uh, Very concrete. <laughs> By the way, I love the fact that you have a metric and an accountability sense where you will measure your your success in terms of impact on others, concrete impact on others. It's not theoretical for you, is it? It's it's something that you know. It's the starting number. It, it is a bit crazy and it's uh, challenging to to kind of you know uh, uh, go against. But then if we can help one hundred thousand, then we can uh, help one million, and then we're not that far off. Kind of you know to to be involved on the other side. But going back to your initial question, so first of all, I would like to invite uh, everyone to visit our website www.ogdm. Uh, dot org. Uh, we're actually releasing a new website with more information on our project. Um, and there are four ways uh, that uh, uh, people can help. Uh, and it's not helping us, it's helping Ukrainians. Uh, something uh, apart from fundraising, because I'm putting that aside, because as you mentioned, uh, money is always important, but there are other ways. Um, we definitely need more people on board. So uh, I'm very happy to, to kind of, you know, uh, leave my email address, which is kuba.lang at org, And, you know, we would have a number of volunteers flying from the U.S. Uh, and, and being involved, whether it's hands-on helping uh, at a train station, handing out food, or getting more operational with some of our projects. So visiting Poland, if you can do something cool uh, over the summer, you're more than welcome, and we're going to be the best host possible. Secondly, if it's going to be, uh, I would say, too time-consuming to fly to Poland, uh, I'm sure that there are ways of getting people involved uh, sort of, you know, in a remote basis. And as I mentioned, we're growing our presence in the U.S., and uh, our uh, American team will definitely have, and we already have enough in the backlog to, to get help with. And something that we have seen as a very, very... Uh, I would say successful and efficient way of helping is striking corporate deals. So if you think about, or if you run or you operate in a business that can send any material donations, whether it's for instance, textbooks for kids, or whether it's uh, you know uh, any clothing, something that can be easily transported without the expiry date, uh, then you know we can either distribute it in Poland or we can distribute it via different logistic routes in Ukraine. So just to summarize, you, you can come and volunteer with us in Poland. You can volunteer with us uh, from the US or any other location. Uh, and then obviously you can help us with, apart from the financial donations, you can um, help us with some material donations uh, of any kind. Well, you've given us an agenda that we can follow, just extraordinarily useful. And you and I will talk uh, right after the show as well. Sure to continue to deepen this. Thank you so much for sharing the work that you're doing. Thank you for the work that you are doing on behalf of us all to ensure that civil society is strong, that that people can actually live free, prosperous, joyous lives. Uh, Mm -hmm. Jakob Lang, please thank your uh, your, uh, people, your partners, your boards, your funders, um, and, and, uh, and even those that you help and are in turn helping others. I mean, you are an example to us all, co-founder from uh, from the uh, for the organization uh, OGDM, or translated from border to apartment or flat. Uh, Jakob Lang, thank you so much for your for your help and for your insights. Really appreciate. Thank you. It. Last thing, Slava Ukraini, and I hope that this is going to end soon. I hope that it. I hope that it is, but I think we have to gird ourselves for a long stalemate, and I think that we have to, as you say, we have to stay focused on support uh, because only through that do we end up with the world that we want. It's how we invest our time and our money that that gives us the future. Have a great Absolutely. day. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much.